Um, about at least a hundred years ago, I have read that in the town of Surrey, which is on the down east coast, right in, uh, up against close to Washington County, um, widows were allowed two bushel, bushels of alewives every spring, and they would come down to collect their bushels. And you know, that little detail of history has always touched me. And I'm wondering if this happened in every town that had an alewife run. But uh, the, when the spring run happens, you know, uh, people come out of their winter homes and I'm sure some of those widows were pretty hungry and they could put can them and put them up. Um, I am starting off the talk to tell you this strange and kind of wonderful story about how uh, people in my town, some people, we were sort of a renegade group. We were like a bunch of cowboys. We weren't part of the town structure at first until the townspeople, the selectmen asked us to form a committee, which we call the Alewife Committee. But in the beginning, when um, my co-chair's children were very small, we happened to go down to Patton Stream. And what we saw were these alewives coming up, just like this, this picture, and it hit butting their noses against an outcrop because on what route 182, 172, a, um, a culvert had been built that squeezed the stream and made the stream flow over a very high bank. So the alewives were stuck. And when the alewives get stuck, they try and try and try and butt their heads. And then if they can't get through, they turn back and sometimes they go to other streams. Other times they release their eggs right in the bay and they disappear into the ocean for another season. And they lose out and everybody loses out. Because as you probably have heard at, with other alewife talks in this wonderful program that you have, alewives feed everybody at a time of year when there's not a lot of food. I mean, the ospreys have just come back. The eagles have overwintered. The seals have come back. The otters are here. The bears are hungry. They're out of hibernation. You get the picture. I mean, the list of things, including ourselves, that eat alewives is long. And here in Surrey, we used to have, I never saw this, this is way before my time, a smokehouse. And there are people who are still alive in the town who talk rapturously about uh, netting the alewives, hanging them up in the smokehouse, using special wood. I can't remember if it was uh, oak. It may have been oak, um, which they would, um, they, they would cover the fire with uh, wood chips. So it was very smoky in there and they'd smoke the fish. And they, to a person, <laughs> said that nothing tastes as good as a Patton Stream alewife smoked from Surrey. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about that, but that's what they said. And they miss it because the smokehouse is gone our run was uh, absolutely impeded. Um, and so just to tell you quickly, um, where do alewives go in the fall and the winter? Well, they go up to the spawn in the um, ponds and the lakes. And then the adults come down. Sometimes they stay in the ponds and the lakes, but usually they spawn and they're going back down in a couple of weeks. Sometimes they're going down when other alewives are still going up. And they feast when they come to the bay because they're so hungry, because there are times during the migration when they don't eat. And then they go in a school way out to the ocean, to the deep water. 
um, there are a lot of things we don't know about aliens. For instance, the schools in the winter become very large. So how do the fish break up into the smaller schools to return to their natal streams? Because that's what they do. They go back to the streams or they try to get back to the streams where they, where they were eggs and little fish. And so it's, there's so much science. We know what we think is a lot about Elwes, but we don't know everything. Um, they're mysterious, as many wild species are. And the babies, the um, fry, go down in the fall with the fall rains. You know, if the stream is kind of dry and bony, when the fall rains come, there's more water in the stream and they just drift down. And if you go and stand in Surrey down at the um, Weirin Pool, which will show you the fish ladder, um, the, you'll see the young ones coming by and they're just floating down and usually tail first. It's kind of funny. Um, so uh, what happened was the, um, some neighbors and I got together and we had seen the bumping of the fish. And so what we did kind of simply, oh, I guess we can go to uh, photograph number two, yeah, was there's, there's the problem that we saw. They can't do that. Alewives, as I'm sure you've been told or know, have known for years, they don't jump like salmon. What they do is they, they kind of swivel up sideways. They're very flat fish. You can see that right here in the picture. And they kind of swivel up in the, through the creeks and the little runs of water to get to the next pool. Um, so something like this, that a salmon would just jump over, they can't do. Um, so what we did um, was to have meetings and to bring a biologist from DMR to our meetings to teach us about alewives. And then we bought some, I mean, this is pretty primitive. We bought some, um, <clears throat> Uh, what am I thinking of? Nets with long poles to move them up. And um, Brian will show you in the next uh, photograph. This is what it looked like where they couldn't get up. You see how wide it is here, but look at how the culvert has just squished the water coming through. Impossible for all but a few, perhaps a few got up. But then the question would be, well, why do they keep returning? I mean, if they never get up, why are there any alewives at all? And the reason there were, we found out, we didn't know, is that the DMR, Department of Marine Resources, was um, taking alewives that couldn't get up, like to China Lake that you're talking about, couldn't access their own ponds, and they were putting them in tanks, you know, sucking them up in tubes, putting them in tanks and putting them in lower patent pond. So Surrey always had alewives going down and then going out to sea, but they really weren't our alewives. And, but they would spawn in our pond and then the babies would go down. So the DMR said, we've had it with this. You guys have got to figure out something better we're going on to other lakes and helping them. We're not gonna put alewives in your stream anymore. Uh, so um, maybe Brian can show us the next slide. Oh, are we going backwards or is that what it, that's what it looked like when the water is fierce. And maybe we could go on to the next. So here we are, that's not me, but that's my neighbor. And here we are carrying fish in nets and um, Brian, if you show the next slide, maybe we can see there. You see, it's very slippery. 
the work is, it's amazing how heavy an alewife net, uh, net full of alewives is, but you can't put too many in the net because you'll squish the ones on the bottom. So every spring we came, kids came, and this is what we tried to do. We never got very many up. We got a few thousand, but there were many more that we had, we didn't get up. It was kind of sad. So then we got um, somebody from the Department of Marine Resources to come and tell us what he thought a fish ladder, a good fish ladder would be. And, and one year we built a fish ladder and I think you may see it in the next, no, we're, we're still lifting, but see, I hope you understand. Yeah, there. So this was the first <laughs> fish ladder that neighbors built and carried down and set in the stream. And as you see, there are a whole bunch of people from Surrey who were really involved in this work. And um, it wasn't easy. Well, here's what happened. The fish totally rejected that, that fish letter. One fish would, might start up it, go up to two steps in the ladder, and then turn around and go out. And we said, well, maybe ju they just need to get used to it. And it's hard to uh, locate a ladder into very rapid running water and stabilize it and get it so um, the bottom is on the uh, bottom of the stream. Um, so it was a lot of work. And then the water, you know, there was a rain, the water came through and it just broke this uh, ladder to pieces. And so um, that was pretty discouraging. We found pieces of ladder all the way down. Now this, I'll have to look again, but I think this is the second ladder we built. So we got the Department of Marine Resources to come back and they explained to us why maybe the first ladder didn't work. So this second one, I don't know if you can see this, but there are little places for the fish to go up. And then we tried to create resting pools on the right-hand side. So the water would run down on the left-hand side. So a fish theoretically would go up and then it would uh, have a chance to rest and then maybe take the next step, et cetera, et cetera. This man is a carpenter. He was so wonderful. His name is Greg Weaver. And he was the one who organized the first uh, fish ladder and then organized this. And I hate to, uh, is, are there, is there another picture of the fish ladder? I can't remember. Oh yeah, the second one was so heavy. We, we had a neighbor who had a construction company came and put it on a truck and then had a, um, what would this be? What is this called? Uh, some kind of lifting machine to pick the ladder up. Oh, and then let's see the next slide. I want you to see, look at this. And so they lifted it down over the bank. It was too heavy to carry. There's a lot of metal in it too. And so they set it up in the stream. I think there may be another picture of that. Yeah, it, it, was, a, it was serious. That, that was, um, I think the first letter. Well, I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I think we can go to the next one. So we'll stop here. The second one, we were so excited. We had fish biologists there to watch with us. The fish were coming up and they went right by the ladder and they tried to jump into the water to get up and they were still butting their heads. So we had two failures. So we spent the next winter very chagrined and writing less letters to everybody, the Department of Transportation, the federal government, uh, the Department of Marine Resources, any place that we thought might be a place 
that would give us some money so we could hire an architect who makes, um, who designs um, fish passages. And nobody was interested in us. So the next year we netted the fish and took them up again. But then, you know how things suddenly change in an historical moment? I mean, first you think we're going one way and then the country goes another. Well, in this state of Maine, suddenly alewives became the hot topic. And everybody was studying alewives. Everybody was looking at culverts. It started when the Edwards Dam on the Kennebec came down in 19, what was it, 99. And they began taking dams down for fish passage, but they weren't thinking of culverts right away. And then they began to think about culverts and how many fish we were losing because of block culverts. So we got suddenly in a rush, $250,000. And an architect designed a beautiful weir and pool. The weir would be the half circle that holds the water. And the, it, it contains two pools, one on each side. So that the water comes down in the middle, because you'll see this. And then there's a little chunk taken out in case the water's low. So the fish can move up and they move to the right or the left and they circle in the pools until they're ready to take the next step up. But the thing that's interesting and very touching to me, whoop, oh, this is the end, is that those blocks of granite were part of a bridge from Sullivan into Hancock, uh, in Hancock County. And my kids and I used to go over the bridge and everybody called it the singing bridge because um, it made a singing noise when you went over. So we bought those stones and they just dropped them right in the stream bed. And then we had a man uh, from, his name was uh, I, I can't, Lance Linkle. And he, was, he had a construction company in Southern Maine. And he came up and he built the weir and pool. And now you can show us, Brian, if you'd like. And here's what it looks like. You remember what it looked like in the beginning. Look at these steps. They're so orderly. And these singing bridge stones are so perfect. And you can see the little notch in the centers. Uh, if the water gets too low for the fish to still go over. So this is, this works so well. We tried to drum up interest. And because we were the first people on the Blue Hill Peninsula to put in a fish ladder. And so we had John Banks from the Penobscot Nation come. And we had Ted, Ted Ames, who is a very, famous uh, fish biologist and also a fisherman come and they would come and we'd be down at the town landing talking about um, the fish and then we'd take people up and before the weir and pool was built they saw thousands of fish they were so impressed but the fish were having a very hard time now we don't give any more <laughs> walk and talks because the fish go through here so fast, nobody can see them. And they just see sort of a shadow going through, boom, 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 boom. And so it's not as uh, dramatic for them. So the, the success of the Weir and Pool Project has actually ended up being not great to talk up to um, citizens about the importance of ill but what we did is because we were the first people on the peninsula to do this, other towns started to do it too on the peninsula. They hired the architect that we had. And now we have, I think five fish passages on the um, peninsula going to pools. And I think they're working on two more. So it, it, it's a wonderful story. And, um, what we still do is every spring, what we're doing now 
is the fish go up and this is a really hard stream for them to go. It's three miles, which you know, the fish you get come up the Kennebec. So, but this is three miles, but there are lots of falls and they're beaver dams. So um, uh, we take a clam hose and we go down, we kayak to the beaver dams and we just open them up, not the whole dam, but just a chunk. Uh, with a clam hoe uh, and the fish go through immediately. And then in the, at night, of course, the beavers come and they, they patch up the whole thing. When we get um, to the pond, there are all these citizens, there must be 35 people who, to, who sign up for a chunk of time and they sit under a bridge and they count the fish going by. We have sandbags that are white on the, on the bottom of the stream so that we can see the fish go by. They're very clear because they're you know dark gray going over the white. And we've learned to count and the fish go in these little pods because they're very, they're, they're very close to each other. They're a school, like a family. So they go in these pots and you learn to count by tens, really, 10, 20, you learn to time it. And so you'll sit there sometimes for an, a long time. And just when you're about to leave, a hundred fish will go by or a 500 fish will go by. And you're counting, you know, 10, 20, 30, <laughs> and then they're gone. They're up into the lake. Um, and people love doing that. It's very quiet. There are a lot of warblers, a lot of birds that come back. Sometimes you see eels in the streams and, and turtles. And it's just a time to get out of your house, to see the beauty of the town, and to be quiet. And we love it. Um, and I think there's a last picture. Isn't there, Brian? I think there's a last picture. There is my neighbor, another neighbor, and he's built this kiosk, and it's all this story about the Patent Stream Alewives, and we wrote it up and, and got it produced. And people come down, and they read it, and then they go and look at the earring. So we've had a great time doing it, but it's been 12 years. And if we had been told in the beginning, that it would take 12 years, we might have quit and not even done it. But you know, you learn more and more every year. And the other thing is you kind of fall in love with the fish. Yeah. So that's what I have to say about that. And now I'd like to, but does anybody have a question? As a question, we could start or? Um, you said it was 12 years, Susan, when these projects happened? We started 12 years ago with the nets. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, as this group of people who just went down. But it's been about 10 years we've been a committee for the town. Okay. So when was the first and second fish ladder around? Was that? Um... Oh, that was, that, the first was before we were a part of the committee. And the second was when we were actually a committee and um, part of the town. And we, here's the thing, the fish biologists who came and talked to us about what alewives like and everything, they were very talented people. And they said, even at the beginning, they said, look, you can put a ladder in and they'll reject it. And sometimes we have no idea why they reject it. So it wasn't that they gave us bad advice. It's that these alewives are very picky. <laughs> okay. And you didn't, you just didn't have the resources you needed to make a, a ladder that the fish would accept. You know, it sounds like for you, the, the weir type pools worked out, um, but it seems with our projects, it, it either includes just the removal of the dams or pretty expensive projects to get the fish to 
be comfortable using it. Um, and we've had some big projects and the fish are definitely accepting the fish letters. They put it in okay. Basilboro, so. Good, good for you. Well, our big break came when this um, architect, uh, we hired this architect because he had worked on all kinds of fish passages. You know, he knew about them in Alaska. He knew about them for salmon. I mean, he, he knew about them for alewives. Uh, that's what we needed was somebody to design it. Um, and uh, we got it. So it was great. And it was the Department of Marine Resources that coordinated a lot of that, you said? Oh, yes. The woman was is named, I think she still works for the department, uh, Claire Enterline. And she, she just, the thing is that we were such a strange group. We, um, they had never seen the gr a group of citizens get together to, you know, advocate for alewives before. So they were very kind of curious about us and they wanted us to teach us and they wanted to help us. And the minute the, the interest changed from removing big dams to taking a look at culverts, all of a sudden, you know, we were something they paid a lot of attention to. Before they'd ignored us completely. <laughs> but that's how things work, I think, really. Um, so shall I talk a little bit about my book? Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Any questions, any questions? So here's my book. Let's see if you can see it. It's called swimming home and brian is going to record me reading it so if you want to listen just to the whole book uh without me talking uh he'll have that in a while probably sometime next week i'll do it but first i want to tell you a little bit of what it's like for being a writer because even though i've done all this work with alewives my life is as a writer. Um, uh, when I first started writing seriously, I was married and bringing up little children and we lived in Prospect Harbor, which is um, uh, even closer to uh, Washington County on Downey's. And I would write in a chicken shed and I'd write poetry. That was what I had studied in college, and that's what I was writing. And I worked in the fish factory cutting um, herring, which they called sardines and put into cans. And my husband then, I'm divorced now, but my husband then uh, dug clams. And that's how we supported ourselves. But he wanted to be a painter. I was trying to write. And so he said to me one night, it was very sweet. He said, you know, do you think you could write something that could make money? Because <laughs> I'd send out my poetry and, and poetry journals would take it, but all I'd get is a couple of, of copies of the journal. I would never get paid. So I said, sure. So I spent about six months reading essays E.B. White, especially, and going to a marsh in our town and putting together the story of this marsh. I interviewed people who remembered when the hay was cut on it. I went and looked at birds. I was very interested in birds. I became a wild bird rehabilitator. And I went and looked at the birds at different times of year. Um, and uh, short-eared owls nested in the marsh. It was very exciting. And I kept writing it and kept writing. And there was a newspaper that came out weekly. It was called Maine Times. It no longer exists. It was a newspaper in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And I, I, we came in the 70s. I was back to, uh, back to the lender person, <laughs> those people. And um, I finally sent them this essay. It was about 10 pages 
of my typing, no internet, nothing like that, typewriter. Uh, we had no electricity, by the way. And I sent them, went to the post office, mailed it, and uh, they called me. We did have a phone. And they said, you're hired. We love it. And I worked for them for 15 years. And they were the best people in the world. They said, do whatever you do, want to do. Write us something and uh, we'll publish it. You know, they may edit it somewhat, but we'll publish it. And so I wrote about ravens. I wrote about salmon. I wrote about all kinds of old forest. And I just learned so much about Maine. And the thing about Maine that I loved, oh, and I was learning about writing. Um, and I loved writing essays. And the thing about Maine that I loved is we may have broken some wild systems, and we had but there was still so much wildness left. I mean, we weren't in New Jersey trying to work our way back to a system that included other species. We still had a ah, wonderful wildness left. We were losing it, but we had a lot left. Um, so uh, I became interested, so I was writing for adults. And then I became interested in teaching children legends in, uh, and also uh, about wild places, about trees, about ravens, and then about fish. And so uh, I had learned quite a bit about alewives, never enough, but quite a bit from the work we did in the town. And um, Tilbury House, which is a main, small main press, um, accepted my idea for writing a story about alewives. And um, I wanted to do it because I wanted to teach children that people in neighborhoods can change the way um, the habitat looks. You can plant trees. You can help alewives. You can do all kinds of things to make it a wilder and a richer place for you and for other species. Um, and so, uh, but there were some problems and some of the problems were these. How do you write a story in which uh, the heroes of the stories are a school of fish? Who's gonna read that? Will the kids think it's boring? So I did know that alewives usually have, this is so interesting, the leaders of the school and the leaders of the school of fish, this sounds crazy, but it's true, are repeat spawners. They've gone to the stream they wanna to return to maybe two or three times. They know how to get there. They're not just messing around. They, they know where to go. And the other fish in the school, the younger ones follow them. So I made a fish. She was a female. Oh, um, my neighbor and dear friend, Rebecca Ray, um, was hired to illustrate it. And it's so interesting. When you write a book, you uh, envision the story. And then you give the book, the manuscript, to an illustrator who sees it differently very often and makes their own story out of the story. So it's a, we work together, but we also keep our separate space. And so she dreams the story into illustration and I dream the story into text. And that's how it works. But I thought I'd just read you how I decided to start the story. So I named the fish Pasca, which means fish in Latin. And she was the lead fish. She's the hero of the story. Um, and the way, I love the way Rebecca drew her. I mean, she's just beautiful. Pesca raced through the ocean with the other alewives in her school as winter winds whipped the water into steep waves and sleep fell. They were hunting tiny animals that drifted in clusters 
sometimes near the surface of the water and sometimes deeper where the light was thin. The alewives swam fast and close together. Often they looked like one big fish flashing silvery scales, but they were many fish with gray green backs, silver bellies, and sharp tails. Behind the curve of their gill covers on each side, they were marked with a small dark spot. That's how I started. And the thing about being a writer is you have to say this story in your mind, especially if it's a children's story, over and over. And so it's good to have a cat so you can talk to the cat who's sleeping on the couch and try it out on the cat or take a walk with your dog and just go over it and, and you dream it into uh, something that you think might work. And then you give it to an editor who makes changes. <laughs> but uh, so in the spring, I, they all uh, swam north and I love this picture. If I... It, can you see the whale reaching and the fish and the porpoises? And I just love, and now of course the porpoises and the whale, they eat alewives. I mean, a whale will take a whole school in a, in a gulp, but that presented a problem for me. So the problem was, was I gonna have some of these alewives die on their trip? Or were I, was I going to have them all make it to the pond? So I remember my son saying, oh, mom, have some of them die. Have, have them taken. And I said, you know, I really love these fish I'm writing about. I'm going to have every single one get to the pond. <laughs> and, and so you see the, the, the whale and the porpoises, but they're not eating. They're just swimming along with the hill. Um, uh, and then here's another animal that eats alewives is uh, a seal, but they get away from the seal. So I'm showing you all the things that want to eat the alewives, but they don't eat my alewives. They may eat other alewives, but not mine. Um, and so then we have to have a person or people come into the story. So I decided to have a boy and his father and the father's rowing the boat and he's telling the boy about the time when there were smoke houses along the stream and that people would gather alewives and smoke them and they'd be sold in, ge in general stores and how good they tasted. I don't know if you've ever eaten a smoked alewife. I have. They're not my favorite thing, but some people swear by them. So here's an interesting picture, if I can show this to you. This is, um, the way I wrote it was an, an osprey coming down and trying to grab one of my alewives. But the editor at Tilbury, who, did, who was in the one who was editing this book, said, oh no, um, this looks more like an eagle foot with a clause. And the thing is, an, uh, an osprey, I, I'm sorry, I've left out a part. I wanted it to be an osprey coming down and taking the fish. She said, oh no, it looks more like an eagle uh, foot. Because as you know, the ospreys, when they go down for a fish, usually put their two talons in the front and then they can move one and they have two in the back. So they have four, but two in the front, two in the back. So she changed it to eagle, which was just fine with me. And then a heron tries to eat the alewives, but misses. So my alewives are blessed. And they get up through um, the beaver dam and they don't have to have somebody come with a clam hoe and put a notch in it. They seem to do what they used to do a long time ago, which is they'll shimmy through any crack in a beaver dam. And so even though we go and notch them, 
I'm not sure they wouldn't do just fine without our help. Um, but that's what we do just to make sure. And um, so I called the culvert a pipe because I wasn't sure the kids who are listening to the story would know what a culvert is. Uh, and pipe was fine with me. Uh, so they all of a sudden, the fish get to the place where they can go into the lake, but there's a new road there and there's a pipe going through it and they cannot reach the pipe. Just what happened to us at Pat and on Patton Street. And they try and they try. Um, here's the thing. We're getting toward the end of the story. And because I hadn't known that we were gonna have a happy ending in our story about Patton's stream, I thought that we were gonna be moving fish with um, buckets or with, with the nets. We learned that we couldn't use the nets that were just metal. We did that the first year and the fish would get hurt. You know, they have that mucus coating. So we got nets that were, um, had the green plastic coating on them so that the fish could, would not get hurt when we scooped them up. Anyhow, the point I'm trying to make is if I had known that we were gonna have this beautiful weir and pool, I might've ended the story with the town getting together and building a weir and pool, but I didn't know it. So I had the boy and his father talk about getting neighbors together to get buckets to scoop up fish and put them in the lake. And, um, and they do, that's what they do. And um, the, the, but the father says, there are gonna be so many more fish coming. What are we gonna do? And the boy says, dad, we'll get other people in the neighborhood to help us. And so that was one of the things that's, that is important to me is that people get involved with the habitat they live on and work together on their land. It means a lot to a lot of people, I think. And so uh, the last picture is of Pesca and her school breaking the surface of the water and flashing their tails in a thank you before they go off into the lake to spawn. And it was so much fun writing it. Um, but it takes a long time. It looks like very little writing, but you want every word to count. And so you write and rewrite and rewrite. And it, it takes time, it takes a long time. Um, one thing I do want to tell you is for the last two and a half years, I've been writing these very short essays for Down East Magazine, and they're wonderful to work for. And so it was especially nice to write through the COVID crisis because I wrote about uh, going out and being quiet and solitary in the woods and along the shore. And I wrote about um, painters and writers who of course need a lot of quiet time to do their work and, and who lived in Maine. And so I am gathering those um, essays together to make a, a book. And that's what I'm going to be doing this summer. That's right. So thank you, everybody. Thank if you, you have any questions, let me know. It was fascinating. And I learned more about alewives than I ever possibly knew. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, what are you, are you planning any more children's books? Well, <clears throat> I have. I have been writing, <laughs> you asked a very sensitive question. I have been writing a children's book for about two years. This one's more complicated. It's about seaweed. And it's about this woman I wrote about in the Seaweed Chronicles who lived in England, who discovered how a certain kind of seaweed works and, and um, propagates 
and that helped the nori industry in Maine, uh, in, in Japan, in Maine, in Japan, after World War II, come back because people were so hungry and the, the nori industry had crashed. The nori is that kind of seaweed that you probably know makes those crunchy little um, uh, sort of like pieces of paper that you can eat of green seaweed, or you can roll them up with rice and fish and everything. So she did this wonderful thing that she didn't know she was doing, which was to help people in a different country far away. And what I um, loved about the story was people helping people um, without destroying the environment. But I'll tell you, I haven't gotten there. I, I don't have this story done and it doesn't work yet. So it may take a long time and I'm trying to figure out how to make it better. Um, because some of the people in the story are real. They really existed. Another story I want to write next is about people down in Mexico who saved a whole, whole bay, a great deal of water and habitat with um, all kinds of fish and corals in it. And the fishermen themselves stopped the fishing and began just so the fish could come back. They didn't stop forever and began having tours and taking tours out and teaching them what the corals and the fish habitat used to look like, what it looks like now, and what they're hoping for the future. I think that's a great story. I love stories like that. They sound wonderful. You'll have to finish them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and thank you for coming to the talk. Thank you. Any other questions out there? We're getting to be at about an hour here, so. Um, I do. Do you do a fish harvest in um? No. At, at your fish Sorry. ladder? No, <clears throat> they're yeah. not. A, Claire Enterline, the DMR says we've got to reach about two hundred and fifty thousand fish, and we're no, we're nowhere near that. We're maybe um, twelve thousand. Okay. You know? Yeah, it's still new. Yeah, and it's a very hard run. You know, there are a lot of boulders. It's the most beautiful stream. If you ever come down, there's a, a trust, a Blue Hill Heritage Trust has a walk along Patton stream. It's gorgeous, but you'll see how difficult it is for the fish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Susan. And well, if there's no you. other questions. Um, thank you for inviting me. I loved it. Take care, everybody.